Hey again, everyone. It is a beautiful snowy day here in Whatcom County, and we don't need to have a snowstorm result in any loss of life. To do that means we need to make some changes. I want to thank you for the questions and comments you've been sending in. I want to try and address some of those. It is really a, a bit of a complicated issue, but it is a solvable one. It's just hard to think about how to have a complex one-sided conversation in bite-sized videos. I know that we all want safe housing for everyone, and we really can get there. I want to talk about the ways, the opportunities that we have in front of us to actually make the changes we need to make to get there. And it's got to start with some honest conversations and a little bit less throwing around of blame because we all participate in this. Uh, and I promised you in the last video that I would tell you a little bit about the types of housing programs we have here in Whatcom County. And I want to do that. But I also want to say that it is complicated and we don't need to be, we don't all need to be expert, experts in the housing system. I have no doubt that our housing case managers, when they watch these videos and listen to me describe the services would cringe because I will get bits of it wrong. But that doesn't actually matter. We need to know that there are services, the types of services that there are, but most importantly, we need to know what the gaps are and what the opportunities are for us, all of us, to participate in fixing them. I think you will agree with me when I say that we have this bad habit when it comes to the challenges of our neighbors of, of out of sight, out of mind. And right now, the, Im the, the impact of our unsheltered neighbors is really visible to us through Camp 210 and other places in our community. And so it's easier for us to remember that there's a problem we should be working on. But there is a whole, un, a whole invisible element to this housing crisis, and this is not new. This, we have had hundreds and hundreds of unsheltered individuals in our community for many years. I am glad that we are now paying attention but let's make sure we don't fall into that trap of out of sight, out of mind. And this is one of the challenges with emergency shelter is that we tend to look for the quickest way to sort of tuck the problem out of view and then we quickly forget what we're supposed to be advocating for. I wanna talk about emergency shelter, but I don't wanna talk about that in this video. I wanna talk about that in the next video. What I'd like to try and do briefly, and I just keep failing to do the brief part, is to tell you a little bit about the continuum of services that are available in Whatcom County from that coordinated entry system that I described in the last video. And, uh, and the thing that has been concerning me most in the, recent, in the conversation of the recent months is that there seems to be this conflation of the fact that we see all of these unsheltered people in our community with that that must that must then mean that the services that we have and the programs that we have are not working and are ineffective that is not the case the services that we provide work really well we just don't have enough of them we have worked really hard the last 15 years in whatcom county to invest in a principle called housing first Housing first is simply the acknowledgement that the best way to respond to homelessness, the most humane and effective and fiscally responsible way to respond to homelessness is not to put someone in an emergency shelter, but to actually take them from homelessness, sleeping in their car or a tent, and put them directly into permanent housing. It is really hard when we ask folks who are unsheltered or in emergency shelter to work on their mental health or to um, work on addiction or substance use, to get themselves enrolled in school, to take care of their medical needs. Those are things that when we as humans don't have our basic needs met, it is very hard for us to work on those long-term goals. This is why Housing First is a thing. It's because when we put people into housing, they are much more likely to very quickly be able to turn back 
to those fulfilling goals for themselves and their family. This is what we want. This is why in the last 15 years, we have not invested in emergency shelter because we don't actually want people in emergency shelter. We want them in housing. So we have to be careful not to lose sight of that as a community, that when we advocate strongly, it is not good enough for us to advocate for emergency shelter and then do the out of sight, out of mind. We must advocate for what we really wanna see, which is healthy, taken care of, whole, thriving humans. Okay, um, I wanna tell you about the continuum of housing services because I keep saying that that's what I'm gonna talk about. We have and I just we have a, we have some really specialized services for special populations, folks with co-occurring disorders, or um, folks who are re-entering from an institution, folks people who are fleeing domestic violence. But the broad brushstrokes of our housing system, you can I, I think about them in three categories: sort of light, medium, and 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 um, intensive. On the light end is something we call diversion. And what that means is when somebody is about to be evicted or they're experiencing a housing crisis, we want to intervene really swiftly because they only need a little bit of help to get back on their feet. That's called diversion. It might mean deposit assistance, a little bit of case management, help applying for some housing units, diversion. We have very little of that. We need to invest in more of that as a community, especially as this wave of COVID economic um, impact is going to hit us. The, the middle section, is called rapid rehousing and rapid rehousing is awesome and it pairs case management with rental subsidy and private sector housing. So anybody in the community who has a vacancy and the case managers will help the household access those vacancies and apply and move in and then we pay their rent for a tapered period of time that is not set in stone. Maybe they need us to help them for six months, maybe they need us to help them for 18 months. We're just gonna stick with them until they get their needs met. That's called rapid rehousing. It has an eight, the, our coordinated entry system, it has an 80% success rate. When, when we serve people with rapid rehousing, they exit into safe, permanent housing 80% of the time. That is a worthwhile intervention. The last piece, the intensive piece, we call it permanent supportive housing. That happens in a whole variety of ways that I'm not gonna get into, but it includes things like Francis Place and 22 North and some of the Lydia Place properties it also includes a little bit of scattered site permanent supportive housing, which means private sector landlords paired with a subsidy, but then the case managers are staying with them permanently. Okay, that's the broad strokes. Uh, I want to let you know that our coordinated entry system in 2019, which is the last year that we have data for yet, we served 2,200 people, 1,400 households, we don't have enough of those services. We must invest in increasing those permanent housing services so that folks don't languish in uh, unsheltered or in our emergency shelters. Next up, I'm gonna talk about emergency shelter and then I wanna start talking about the opportunities in front of us so that we can help move from the conversation that we're currently having to the conversation we need to have, which is gonna mean for us, all of us, taking a look in the mirror and saying what needs to change what are the big changes that we need to make as a community if we actually want to get to a place where we have equity around housing and around all sorts of other things thanks for sticking with me and i'll talk to you soon